It must be this spot here. Everybody turns into a preacher when they stand here. <laughs> Thank you for your help this morning, Kevin. I have a very different type of message. Good morning. Some of you I haven't seen for a little while, and it's good to have you back. Good to see your faces. <laughs> Amen. A little different message this morning. I want to talk to you about five modern kings, and it kind of starts out this way in Joshua 10. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would. In honor of the reading of God's Word this morning, Joshua 10, verse 15, and I'm reading from the New King James. It said, Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. But these five kings had fled and hidden themselves in a cave at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings have been found hidden in the cave at Makeda. So Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. And do not stay there yourselves, but pursue your enemies and attack the rear guard. Do not allow them to enter their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. Then it happened while Joshua and the children of Israel made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they had finished, that those who escaped entered fortified cities. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. No one moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Remember there were five kings who had united together to destroy Israel. They thought they could come against Israel and destroy Israel. Then Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me from the cave. And they did so, and they brought out those five kings to him from the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. So it was when they brought out those kings to Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who were with him, Come near and put your feet on the neck of these kings. And they drew near, and they put their feet on their necks. Then Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees until evening. Would you bow your heads with me, please, and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now to thank you for your awesome presence in this house this morning. Father, you have already, you are already walking up and down in the midst of this church, Lord, and I thank you that the candlestick of new life is bright and burning, not only here, but in heaven as well. And Father, we thank you that you're an almighty God. We thank you that no enemy, no weapon, Lord, if you are for us, no one and no thing can be against us, Lord God. So, Father, reach out this morning through your word and encourage and strengthen every heart. Help those that feel weak and faint, Lord, in you to be re-strengthened and renewed and strengthened in the inner man this morning as we share together in the presence of your spirit, your word. And, Father, speak to us things out of eternity, Lord God, that will help us to walk before you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Father, I pray now, I ask that your Holy Spirit, that is the comforter, the counselor, the teacher, and the guide, would speak to each and every one of our hearts in our individual lives and situations. And your word is so wonderful and so powerful and so mighty. And Lord, so able to save those that come unto you through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you look at the Bible, even the Old Testament, and some of these stories, and all you see is history, and all you see is ancient stories, you are missing the whole point of the Word of God, of the Bible. Because there is not one jot, not one tittle, Jesus said, that is not some spiritual food and fruit and brings life and direction and wisdom and grace into our hearts and lives. What we are reading right now sounds very hard to us. It sounds very strange to us. We are of a Western mindset. We are 
those that have walked with the Lord and we know how good and loving and kind and merciful He is and yet we hear of five kings who hid themselves in a cave. They were kind of like politicians. They were in the middle of a war. They started it. They were letting all their armies out to be slaughtered while they ran and hid. And I don't mean to be unkind to any politician that isn't that way. But most of the time, you know, the wars are not fought by politicians. <laughs> And they went and they hid in a cave. They knew that, that they were losing the battle and they ran and they tried to hide themselves in the caves. And, you know, Joshua set a stone over it because the battle wasn't over yet. And he said, we'll deal with them later. There's a lesson here. The lesson is, is that whenever you are reading Scripture, you have to keep a much larger view in mind than just each situation and circumstance that you look at. We're talking about wars and rumors of wars here, and war is a very terrible and ghastly thing and should always be considered as the last resort when all other means of good have been exhausted. I know there's a lot of talk right now, and I've talked some of it too, about revolution and that sort of thing, but God forbid that we would have to get in any kind of war because war is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. You have to get the larger picture, though. When you read Scripture, you have to always look at it. Try to look at it from God's view. God had waited 430 years for these people, these tribes that these five kings represented. He had somehow, and the Bible doesn't tell us how, but somehow He had reached out to them to bring them into some kind of relationship with Him. And He had done it for 430 years. He sent Abraham into Egypt, He said, because the sins of the Amorites is not yet full. But now it was full. And these men weren't just, you know, good old boys and good old guys that were, you know, out trying to you know, target practice for a day. These people were evil to the nth degree. And God had waited long enough. When we look at any moment in time alone in a war, the sight is always a pitiful one. I recently watched a documentary on the anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. And the human suffering that was inflicted was unimaginable on those citizens. We dropped an atom bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, and literally in a second, 70,000 70, people were just vaporized. And we waited for the surrender of Japan, and it didn't come. So two or three days later, we dropped another bomb on another city, and thousands were vaporized. And in the two or three years after that, there would be 20, 30, 50,000 more people that would die from the effects of it. I heard somebody say one time, they said, Americans are the only nation in history that have barbecued two cities. But just like these kings that are hiding in the cave, you can't just look at that one moment in time and what happened. I had a strange experience a few years ago. My grandfather, one of my grandfathers on, on my mother's side, lived in Kentucky and he made some part of the atom bombs that were dropped on those two cities. And I say some part because I remember reading a, a certificate he got because what they did with that bomb is it was so top secret is they sent different parts of it to different parts of the country and he had people making things and they, he didn't know what he was making at the time. But he made some part that went into that atom bomb. But the strange experience I had is I went down to the Air and Space Museum a couple years ago down next to Dulles and I was standing on a platform looking in the cockpit windows, Walt, of the Enola Gay. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that was the B-29 bomber that they used to drop that first atom bomb. What was so strange for me was I knew that my grandfather was connected to it. 
I knew that plane was connected to it, and there I stood. How ironic is it to stand and look in the cockpit of that airplane and realize that in some small way you were part of that history? A couple years before that, and this is where it all started with Japan, I was able to go to Oahu, and I was able to go out to Pearl Harbor, and I was able to go out to the memorial of the Arizona that had been bombed on December 7th, 1941. There were five or 6,000 sailors that woke up that morning. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, and they were just out exercising on the decks of the plane, and, and Japan did a surprise attack and killed over 3,000 of them, I believe it was. And I've stood in that memorial, and I've looked, and I've watched that oil drip up out of that thing. There's over 1,100 men still in that thing, in the bottom of that harbor. Japan, prior to us dropping those bombs, had went into the Philippines. They had went into all of the islands between them and Australia, and they mercilessly murdered not only soldiers, but men and women and children. They had decided that they would never surrender, that they would give their lives if they had to for the imperial emperor of Japan, and they slaughtered millions of people. We had gone with our Air Force carriers and our ships and our battleships, and we had, we had to go in and take enough islands to get close enough to be able to do something to them. And in that time, we had lost thousands and thousands and thousands of men. And the Japanese would do things like they would put bombs in their dead and, or their wounded, and even when our men would go and try to help them, they'd be blown to bits by it. Sharing all that to say this to you, you can't, when you look at war, you can't just look at what happens in a moment and in a time. And one of the biggest mistakes we're making right now in this country, and they're doing it all around the world, is we're trying to judge this generation and the things that are going on now by generations past. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's a different time. It's a different day. And see, these kings were like that. They had caused so much bloodshed and havoc and all the other things. And, and we look at it, and I've even talked to atheists. They said, man, God is a mean God. He just kills people right and left. No, God is a righteous God, a holy God. We dropped those two bombs on Japan. We only wanted to drop one, but they wouldn't surrender. And the only other thing we would have been able to do had we not been able to drop those bombs is we would have taken literally a couple million of young men and women of America and we would have marched them onto the homeland of Japan and slaughtered thousands more trying to stop somebody that wanted to help Hitler dominate the world. So I know even in our day, even when I watched this documentary the other night, they kind of, you know, oh, it's so bad, we did this, we did that. You've got to remember what preceded that if you're going to be fair and just about it. See, we've got, what I'm saying is this. We've got to look at life in broader strokes always because freedom isn't free. Peace comes through battle. Life, believe it or not, comes through death. And every garden's only a planted cemetery. <laughs> I know that sounds hard, but it's true. And who can truly understand the philosophy of destruction, the apparent wastefulness of God? See, it's a mistake to suppose that destruction in life and in the world isn't necessary. It is, or God wouldn't allow it. In fact, God spoke to Jeremiah before he started his ministry, and he said, See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. First, to rule out, to root out rather, and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. How many of you know sometimes you've got to tear the wrong thing down before the right thing can be built up and built up correctly? <laughs> I knew God had to take me very, very low before He could start working on me and bringing me up. In Hosea 6, 1, it says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us, 
but He will heal us. He has wounded us, but He will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before Him. I will say this to you. If you've never felt like God has wounded you, if you've never felt like God has hurt you, you haven't walked with Him for very long. <laughs> and I know we don't like to talk about that in our day and time. We, we want to hear you know, all the positive stuff and all the blessing stuff and all the other things, but how many of you know God has to take us sometimes through the fires and through the waters? He says they won't touch you. They won't harm you if you continue to walk with Him, but sometimes we got to go through it. If we look at the death of these five kings as merely historical fact, then we miss the living Word of God, what it's speaking to us today. Because these five kings, believe it or not, are alive and well today. And just like in Joshua's day, they need to be put down today, and some of them in us, just as surely as they were put down then. <laughs> the king of Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem means peace. That's what it means. But this is a false peace. This king didn't represent God's peace. He didn't represent God's way. He represented a false peace. The Bible said there's a false peace where men cry peace, peace when there is no peace. God also said there's no peace for the wicked, saith God. I know sometimes when I'm preaching, some of you think, Pastor Ken, it's awful hard stuff. But you know what? One of these days, you and I both are going to leave this planet. Nobody gets out of it alive. And I don't want you to have some false hope and some false peace that gives you the warm fuzzies while your life is really not right with God and where you may stand before God one day and hear Him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Dear little lady said to me one time, I was preaching, she'd come up and she said, and she loved me to pieces. She said, Pastor Kent said, somebody's complaining about how hard your preaching was. She said, but I took up for you. I said, you did? She said, yeah. I told him, said, he's got to preach like that because we only listen about half what he says anyway. And she's just sincere as she could be. <laughs> and true as she could be, Charlie. <laughs> Amen. Wouldn't you rather somebody challenge you, somebody wake you up, somebody jar you? Wouldn't you rather go out of church saying, God, am I sure I'm right, rather than have some false peace where you're lost forever. <laughs> Isaiah 48, 17 said, The Lord, the Savior, the Holy One of Israel says, I am the Lord your God, and I teach you for your own good. I lead you in the way you should go. If you had obeyed me, then peace would have come to you like a full-flowing river. Good things would have come to you again and again like the waves of the sea. You know, if you're real with God and... and you're honest with God, and you seek to walk with God with all of your heart and soul, it doesn't matter what is going on in the world. I'm telling you. People say, Ken, how you doing? I said, I got peace that passes all understanding. I got the joy of the Lord down in my heart. They said, well, what about the economy? What about no coins? And I said, it don't matter. God is my source. In fact, I got a couple months ago when this thing first started, I got to spend more time with my wife than I've got to spend in the whole time since I've been a Christian. I looked at her one day, I said, you know, if it wasn't for everybody dealing with such terrible stuff, I said, I like this. <laughs> I like this. I got more arrested than I've been since, probably since I got saved. Because I've been busy about the Father's business. If you will walk with God the way God asked you to, like He said. Let Him teach you and lead you and learn to obey Him. You'll have peace. It, it won't matter. The whole world can fall down around you and God has still got you. And I thank God for that. I don't know how lost people are doing it right now. I really don't. I really don't. 2 Corinthians 13.5 said, Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you're holding to your faith and showing the proper fruit of it. Test and prove yourselves. Do you not yourselves realize and know thoroughly by an ever-increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved on trial, and rejected? 
Man, the one thing I don't want to do and the one thing I don't want you to do is play at Christianity. Play time is over. <laughs> if you don't see anything else around you, you need to realize play time is over. You're going to have to be the real deal from here on out. I'm telling you, you are. So the king of Jerusalem, if you're not the real deal, you need to put that king, and that king's probably you. If you've got a false peace, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a conscience void of offense both toward God and toward man, and you need to pray right now, today, right here, and say, God, forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, make me whole, and help me to walk with you. Lead me in the way. And then the second king was the king of Hebron. Hebron means alliance with, a joining with a false fellowship. <laughs> some of you really need to hear this. Not all of you, all of you, some of you have learned it long ago, but some of you need to realize that false fellowship needs to be killed. God has always been against unholy alliances. You hang around the wrong people. You fellowship with the wrong people. You constantly run with the wrong people. You're going to end up in wrong and bad places in bad ways. Some of you would be twice the Christian that you are now if you quit hanging around with some of the people you hang around with. That's right. One of the reasons most drug addicts can't get free is they not only will they not give up drugs, they don't want to give up the people and the lifestyle and the, the places that they roam and run. God saved me out, out of all that on a Monday morning. And I didn't go to AA and I didn't go to drug rehab and I didn't go to all kind of counseling and 12 steps and everything. And there's nothing wrong with any of those if they help you and you're actually making ground. But you know what I did do? I got saved on Monday. I started church on Wednesday. It was about 14 years before I ever missed a church service again. And Bible study and prayer. I did what the gospel said to do. And I'll tell you what, if you'll start walking with God and get filled with God, you won't have to worry about leaving your wrong friends. They'll leave you. <laughs> But I'm telling you, everybody that you're around, it's one thing if you're lifting them out. If they're pulling you down, you need to get away from them. 2 Corinthians 6 said, Can Christ agree with the devil? Can a believer share life with an unbeliever? Amen. Can God's temple contain false gods? Clearly, we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. The Lord says, get away from unbelievers. Separate yourselves from them. Have nothing to do with anything unclean. Then I will welcome you, the Lord Almighty says. I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters. Now, I know what some of you are sitting there thinking. Well, Pastor Ken, how are we going to win the loss? If we don't go out around and we don't talk to them, we don't share with them. I'm not talking about you spending a little time somewhere to have an effect for Jesus Christ on people. I'm talking about you fellowshipping constantly with people who have no intention of serving God or anything else, and you keep running in their circles. That's what I'm talking about. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that if we were going to get away from every sinner, we'd have to leave this planet. But he said, especially if people tell you they're a Christian and they're still sinning against God, still doing things they're not supposed to do, and you hang around them, you're wrong. Paul said, don't even eat a meal with somebody like that. See, I'll be with any sinner anywhere that I can and I can draw them closer to God. <laughs> but you start naming the name of Christ, you're supposed to depart from iniquity. You're supposed to start walking the talk. And you're supposed to start living for God. And if you tell me you're a Christian and you keep living in sin, you're not a Christian, you're a liar. Unless I'm married to you, I need to get away from you. And God tried to keep some of you from doing that and you won't listen. Hello? Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'll change her. I'll change him. And now your life's a living hell. 
because you won't listen to God. But He can still redeem you and He can still redeem them and you need to stay married to them, but you need to get so full of God they either get saved or run away. That's what Jesus says. That's what the Word says. <laughs> See, this is false fellowship. The Lord tells us, be separate, come out from among them. Live the Christian life. Your life should be different. Where you travel, what you do, who you hang with should be different. I've got unsaved people I play tennis with. It's an outreach. I'm trying to reach, and I have led some of them to Christ. But I only spend a little bit of time with them. They want me to go drink with them. They want me to come to parties. They want me to do all the other things, and they think it's strange that I won't. <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> but I do want to lead them to Christ. There's a difference between being able to have a positive effect on people and you being drugged down by it. And then the third king is the king of Jarmuth. This is really one. This is almost an American disease. You know what Jarmuth means? It means to be high and lifted up. We Americans, American Christians have a disease. It's called American Idol. And I'm not talking about the television program. I don't know if I've ever watched it. I don't know that much about it. But this is our disease. We don't want to just be everyday people. We want to be rock stars. We imagine in our own minds that I'm just going to, I'm going to change the world. And that would be okay because I love that America is so free that if you really want to work at and go at something that you can just about be and accomplish anything you want to be. But here's the negative side of that. We're so busy trying to be rock stars that we don't live everyday life for Jesus Christ like we should. That's right. We want to do the next big thing. We're always seeking the next big thing. I know people that have, down through the years, I've been a pastor for 35 years, they'll stand and tell me, Pastor Ken, I want to reach every child in the darkest reaches of Africa. Now forget about those kids over in children's church. They can die and go to hell. Now they don't say that, but that's what they're really saying. But I want to be a part of something big. I want to change the world. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> we are rarely, if ever, satisfied to live simply and lovingly within the lines of our own conscious strength and do the work which God has obviously designed and created us to do. If I had every person that was a part of this church that walked out of these doors because they were going to go change the world, if they would have just stayed here and done the little bit that God asked them to do, we would have already changed the whole town. <laughs> and most of them go out and end up doing nothing doing nothing because they never get settled and they never get planted and they never become a part of anything. It takes more than you to conquer the world, I can tell you. But we never learn that. Our eyes are always on something big. We want to be the American idol. You want to change the world, <laughs> but not for anybody you know or that you live with or that you can see. You want to change the world, I'll tell you how to change the world. Go home and learn to love and serve your family and your neighbors and your friends the way God wants you to and your employer the way God wants you to. You will change the world. You won't change all of it, but you'll change some of it around you. The Bible said don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly and rightly. Figure out who and what you are in God and what He's really called you to do and then be faithful to do it. There was a little lady about this high, about big rounds of pencil in the first church that I went to after I got saved. For 50 years, I remember because they gave her this big award one day. 50 years she had walked into a Sunday school class and taught Sunday school faithfully every Sunday for 50 years. You want to talk about somebody change the world? That'll change the world. <laughs> Some of you 
fight with yourself, put yourself down, hurt yourself daily in your mind because you think, I need to be like this one, I need to be like that one, I need to be like the other one, I need to be doing this and doing that and doing that. You just need to be you. You need to be the best version of you for Jesus that you can be. And be happy to do that. Be happy to do that. Say, God, thank you every day that you gave me breath and life and whatever this job is, I'm going to do it heartily as unto the Lord with everything that I am. And God, if you got some other big door or thing to open, you open it, but I'm not doing it. I'm not going after it. Romans 12 said, I beseech you or beg you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I had a new convert ask me on Facebook the other week. She lives out of state and she said, Pastor Ken, she says, I've been watching your messages and I hear you talking about serving the Lord. She said, I don't know what to do. She said, I don't preach and I can't play the piano and I don't sing. For some reason, we think that's the only thing you can do. <laughs> and I told her the same thing I'm telling you. I said, be the best mom. She's got a beautiful little boy. I said, be the best mom for him and for Jesus that you can possibly be. And I said, you'll change the world. <laughs> That's what it's about. And then there's the fourth king, Lachish. Lachish means hard to be captured. It's almost out of reach. What it's really speaking to is our security. God's been speaking to all of us about our security through all of this. You know that, don't you? He's saying, what are you really trusting in? What really gives you peace and security and calm? How many of you saw my post on Facebook about calm is a superpower? <laughs> it is. God's shaking some things, isn't he? Shaking the economy. Shaking the politics. Shaking our family life. Shaking our neighborhoods. He's shaking everything. But I love what the Bible says. He'll shake it so that those things that cannot be shaken <laughs> will remain. He's got us in the sieve. That's what he's got. See, it's easy to think we're trusting in God for our finances until we're not sure about our job. Until we didn't get the stimulus check or the unemployment check that didn't come through. See, the king of Lachish is somebody that's trusting in the wrong thing. I hope your trust isn't in money. Because I got news for you. It's got wings. It can fly any moment, <laughs> any time. It is here today and gone tomorrow. For some of you, it's gone quicker than that, isn't it? I hope it isn't your youth and your beauty. Is it just me or do any of the rest of you look at them single... Young ladies on Facebook that all they can put on Facebook is a picture of their self. I'm thinking, God, please give them a husband. That's going to wear out shortly. <laughs> that's all they concentrate on. That's all they got left. And if they don't find one now, man, that's going to go away soon. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. See, you're going to age and it's going to fade. And you know what? Even your physical and mental strength, some of us think we're all that in a bag of chips and we know more than everybody and God's going to reach down and flick one day and you ain't going to remember why you went in the other room and come back. I know, firsthand. Yeah. I told somebody the other day, I said, used to, I'd leave one room, go in the other, and couldn't remember what I went in for. Now I can't even get out of the first room. I knew I was headed for something. <laughs> Maybe it's the flattery of men. Good boy. Good girl. Fickle little bunch they are. 
you got to be careful. If you're wanting the praise and the gratitude and the flattery of men, if that's the thing that floats your boat and inspires you and keeps you going, guess what? They'll cry Hosanna one day, Deb, and crucify him the next. We're all fickle like that. <laughs> A great poet, Tennyson, said this one day. He said, victory and defeat treat both of those monsters the same. We like to succeed. We've got to learn how to fail too, don't we? You've got to learn how to fail in a way that you don't give up, you don't quit, you don't turn around, you don't run in the other direction. <laughs> you've got to learn how to do both. And you've got to make sure that your security is in Christ. You know, I'd like everybody to like me, and I know you can't even believe this, but there are people that don't. And that'd be okay, but some of them down through the years would like to tell me about it. And I'm like you, it hurts. I don't feel good. It takes me a while to get over it. I used to try to defend myself. I don't do that anymore. I've, I've gotten a little wiser. Your friends don't need it and your enemies won't believe it anyhow. So you might as well just let them think what they think. But you know what saves me in the midst of all that? <laughs> I say, God, what do you think? And sometimes he says, you know that thing they said to you, the reason they don't like it? Yeah, you need to fix that. Yeah. Some of the greatest spiritual growth I've ever had in my Christian walk has come from people who are being mean and nasty. I used to be really legalistic. I did. There was a time in my life where I had no television in my house. I didn't listen to or read anything that wasn't Christian. I had a little girl get in my face one day. She said, Pastor Ken, you think you're all holy and all that? She said, you know how holy you are? I said, well, I think you're going to tell me. She said, I am. She said, you're as holy as every lost sinner was a hundred years ago when they didn't have all that stuff. I said, well, the Holy Spirit said, well, how do you like that? That girl's being hateful, but she changed my life. She did. Why? Because our security has to be in Christ always, always. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. <laughs> you can probably sing that, can't you? That's where your security is. You say, oh, I, I think I'm this, I think I'm that, I'm down on my, forget about all that. Just make sure your heart and your life is right with Christ. And you're walking in all the light that you know to walk in. And be pleasing to God. And if you're not, you need to repent. Get whatever it is under the blood and keep on walking. Amen. And last but not least, the king of Eglon. Eglon, strangely enough, means calf. The calf. And it pertains to the whole system of false worship and idolatry. It's, it's, remember what Aaron said to Moses after he come back down from the mountain? He said, that gold calf just jumped out of the flower. I don't know where, where that thing came from. And everybody just started dancing around it, and I let them. Kind of like our kids getting caught in a cookie jar. Mom, I want you to pray you never catch me again. <laughs> yeah, it means golden calf. It means false religion. There's a mocking voice in the Scripture about golden calves. It says... This God speaking, he said, Thy calf, O Samaria, has cast you off. And like I said earlier, the worst thing I could do to you as a minister is stand up here and just flatter you and feed your ego and make you go out of here with warm fuzzies all the time while you're living like the devil and on your way to hell. And so you got to be careful about how you hear. Jesus said, Be careful how you hear. 
what you listen to. The Bible warns us that in these last days, scoffers are going to come. People don't want to hear the truth. They want people that will tickle their ears and make them feel okay whether they're right with God or not. Don't be one of those. I'd rather sit under somebody that preached so hard that I went out crawling on my knees and getting right with God than to stand and tickle my ears and my heart while I die and go to hell. That's the reason I stand here in the way that I do. People say, how can you preach like you do? I said, I'm more afraid of God than I am of them. Amen. Amen. I love her. She loves me too. That's that little redhead over here. I had a couple meetings with her parents and she just said, she's a flirt. In Hosea 8, 2, it says, They shall cry unto me, My God, we Israel know Thee. But Israel hath cast off that which is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They've set up kings, but not by me. They've made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols that they may be cut off. He hath cast off thy calf, O Samaria. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel is even this. The workman made it, and it's no God. Yea, the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. For they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. He hath no standing grain. The blade shall yield no meal. If it be so, if it so be it, it yield, strangers will swallow it up. You don't want false religion. You don't want false Christianity. You don't want to embrace lies. That's what this king is. I love when Jesus is sitting at the Last Supper and he says to all the disciples, he said, one of you is going to betray me. What I love about it is every one of them said, Lord, is it me? There wasn't one of them, except for the one that was going to do it, that sat there and said, oh, ain't me, man. I'm, I'm too good. I'm too right with God. I'm too... You and I need to walk in reverential fear and awe of God every moment, every second, every hour, every day of our lives. And say, God, make sure my heart and my life is right. Make sure I'm not feeding myself lies. There's a lot of Gospels in the world, especially in this country. Get in the book. People ask me all the time, say, Pastor Ken, what, how can I learn the Bible? Read it. <laughs> Read it and get in it and forget about what everybody else has to say. This will shed great light on commentaries. It really does. All those commentaries aren't right just because you read a little bit here and a little bit there. Because there's whole systems of religion out here. But if you want to know the truth, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. But the truth is life-changing. It isn't just head-changing, it's life-changing. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the platform if you would. See, it's the way of false teachings and false gods to betray those that follow them. False teaching, even false Christianity, it works all right in the sunshine. It's not good when things go hard. People ask me all the time about different religions. And there's a lot of my, this is what I tell them. I said, great religion to live by, you don't want to die by it. <laughs> You don't want to die following that. And see, many an idea of religion and Christianity are fine as long as life's going fine. But I want you to have a relationship with God that when the winds and the storms of life assail you, you're still going to be able to stand because you are built on that rock of knowing and doing God's Word. Amen? <laughs> you know, I just, I'm done. I want you to think about something. Jesus is coming back one of these days. I love that thing that says he didn't stay dead and he won't stay gone. He's coming back one of these days. And you know, my Bible says that one of these days when he comes back, for those who aren't right with God, they're going to be like these five kings. They're going to be hiding in caves, praying for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and cover them. But just like these five kings, there is going to be no place to escape the judgment of God. So we got a chance to get right now. And if you're not right, you can make it right right here today.
as we worship in the presence of the Lord. You can just say, God, I need you to cleanse me. I need you to wash me. I need you to make me a child of God. And then, Father, teach me, guide me, get rooted and grounded and settled in the Word. Don't take my Word or anybody else's for anything. Just get in the Word and see what God is saying to you. He will speak to every hungry heart and life. God will move mountains and heaven and hell for a heart that's hungry for Him. Amen. Would you stand, please, and bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I just come before you right now to thank you for your goodness and your love, to thank you that your Spirit always speaks to us. You keep us on the straight and narrow, Father. God, when we are born again of your Spirit, we hear a voice before us and behind us saying, not to the right hand or the left, this is the way. Walk in it. And Father, my prayer is, is that every person under the sound of my voice, whether they're in this room today or listening later, that, God, our hearts and lives would be right with you. And that, God, we would just be the best version of us for you. Nobody else can do that, Father, but you in us. Christ, the hope of glory. Amen. Let's worship.